Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Vincent Baycote. I teach theology here at Wheaton College, and I'm the director of the Wheaton College Center for Applied Christian Ethics. Uh, to my... <laughs> To my, thank you. Uh, to my far right is my colleague, Dr. Christina Bieber Lake, and uh, we. He's a professor. Yes. And uh, we, we're excited to have a conversation here with Dr. Robinson and Dr. Williams. So, our first question, my first question is for Dr. Robinson. Um, Describe for us this uh, experience of being at a conference where you're hearing these various angles on your work. What have you found intriguing, surprising? That's kind of a difficult question. <laughs> I, um, it, it's all intriguing to me, you know? There's a, there's a, I mean, it's interesting seeing my books put through a sort of filter that is entirely appropriate. You know, I mean, I do have this little, um, you know, interest in theology that I've mentioned before. But, <laughs> but um, it's, it, the whole thing is just very, I, uh, I feel as if, in a certain sense, people are talking about someone else simply because it's hard to feel that you have written a book that you wrote you know, several years ago, and it, it has developed its own history in a certain sense, and you're sort of surprised to see that it has a life in the outside world, and, <laughs> you know, um, it's been very interesting and kind of a um, singular experience. Not much in life prepares you, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not being at all articulate. Uh, I think it will take me about a week or two to decide what I would actually, what I would have wished to have said in response to your question. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we're so delighted to have both of you here together, and our hope is that we'll have a conversation between the two of you. Um, Denise Levertov, who's one of my favorite poets, uh, once wrote that where Wallace Stevens says that God and the imagination are one, I would say that the imagination, which synergizes intellect, emotion, and instinct, is the perceptive organ through which it is possible, though not inevitable, to experience God. You've both written or talked about how there's something about creating and receiving imaginative work, particularly fiction, that provides insight into the divine. So how would you articulate that for our audience here? And Dr. Williams, why don't you start? Right, thank you. Um, The trouble is, I think, with the word imagination, people often suppose that it, it's making things up, you know, capital M, capital T, capital U. And people who write, um, in, even in a small way, as, as I do, I think know that there's, there's an element of real discovery about it. You, you're generating new questions, new new stimuli as, as you work. And I mean, I've, I've never, to the world's great relief, written a novel, but <laughs> I, I do write poems. And the experience of writing a poem is very often that sense that you half hear something and you know you've got to work at it. You know, you know you've got to let it unfold. And you don't quite know where it's going. And sometimes where you thought it was going is absolutely not where it ends up, and, and so on. But all of that makes me think precisely that the imagination really is a faculty in us which, which uncovers something, which is not just, as I say, making things up. And more recently, trying to write, um, to write a play, the sense of listening hard is, is very powerful. I mean, I don't know, Marilyn, I'd, I'd guess that for the novelist, that listening is is part of it, and and the sense that you've got to go on listening because there's a bit you haven't yet listened to fully. No. That's it is very true. Um, one of the things that is interesting when you become involved in a novel that you're writing is how strongly voices um, become real to you, so that so that if you give someone 
a word that person would not use, a phrase that person would not use. It rings in an unpleasant way in your mind, and you have to go back and fix it. You know, you've, it, it, uh, you lose control, writers always say that, but you lose options as the fiction becomes more and more realized. I, I love that poem that you allude to that, um, you know, uh, how, how high that brightest candle lights the dark, is that it? How high that highest candle lights the dark, Wallace Stevens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a very beautiful metaphor for, for the feeling of writing in the sense that you always know that you're approaching something you had not anticipated and that you are also not reaching it. You are always only approaching it. Um, I think the imagination, we, I really would like very much to see us break down our habits of thinking about the mind and just accept the mind as a given thing that by the grace of God has a thousand capacities and a th million moments. And um, I think a lot of people are restricted in their use of their imagination by some sort of, you know, uh, this crude notion of a, you know, a brain like half a walnut sitting in your head, you know, getting you through the day, when in fact it is a fantastically brilliant and complex object always in every mind. You don't know what, you, you have to push and push and then you find out that it's capable of so many things that you have to have a sort of, I think, religious awe. I, one of the books of yours that I really love is Absence of Mind. Um, because I think very succinctly and in a very focused way, you, you expose there the strangeness of the way in which we seem to want to use our mind to diminish our mind. The, you know, the, as if the great cultural achievement of our day were to make us less than we are. <laughs> it's, very it's, it's very odd. It's very odd. odd. <laughs> so um, going back to that part about you know, how does art get us in contact with the divine, and I'm just curious, how can the church be more open to the transformative powers of the arts? Is there any way that we can be more involved in being better fiction readers, having some sort of openness to the divine that comes through that experience? <laughs> Um, I think that one thing is that much literature is in a very sort of strict etymological sense of the word subversive. It wants very much for you to think about something in a way that you would not otherwise. The same is true of poetry. And, um, you know, sometimes people who, uh, subscribe to goodness, you know, in a, in a programmatic way, uh, are resistant to, to, to surprise, even when the surprise is something telling you that, for example, people that you might not value are richly valuable, you know, things that if they were internalized and taken as true would, would very much broaden your life, very much enhance your life, their lives, you know. Um, so I, th I mean, I think that, I, you know, Christianity is subversive in that sense. You know, Christ became a slave, you know. Um, it's, it's to undercut cultural assumptions about what is valuable, what the hierarchies are, in fact, and so on. Uh, the art sort of reproduces that, that, that great overturning whenever it's good art. And I think that, that also explains why it's very difficult for the church, so to speak, to, to commission or control art. It's not as if, and you know, some, some people come at it this way, don't they? They say, well, art's obviously very important. Okay, let's have some Christian artists around the place. And you think, oh, please. <laughs> um, because it's, it's much more a matter of the church so nourishing three-dimensional human minds and hearts, that there are people who are touched by a genuine sense of that subversive fullness, which is grace, that they, they can go and explore. And also, I think, it's about the church being hospitable to some of the, the difficult voices and the difficult images that come in. I, 
I've done a bit of work from time to time on, um, on the poetry of George Herbert. And to me, he's one of the great poets of the, the English language. And people sometimes have this picture of George Herbert as a sort of sweet, saintly 17th century character, um, looking very demure in his little white collar. And, and you read the poetry, and it's, it's angry and cynical and ironic and passionate. And it's as if the image I've sometimes used is it's as if he lets the imagination gallop off in a direction that can be very, very, very troubling. And then at the very last moment, at the cliff edge, there's a squeal of brakes. And Herbert sort of turns around to you and says, see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, you've both written uh, and given evidence of writing with great depth and, and beauty and even simplicity. Um, sometimes, you know, people in my discipline in theology don't always write quite that way. <laughs> Um, how does one write theology well so you can write with clarity and, and simplicity and beauty? I wish somebody would tell me. I mean, you're, you're very kind, but I have to say that not every reviewer agrees with you on that. Um, I think I'm conscious here of, of how there are different publics, different audiences for different sorts of theology. I'm, I'm not one of those who thinks that difficulty in itself is a bad thing. My poetic hero, Geoffrey Hill, great English poet who died two years ago, always used to say, you know, so what's the problem about difficulty? What's difficult about difficulty? He would something, talk, this poetry is very difficult. Yeah, very <laughs> difficult. I mean, some things just are difficult, get used to it. And, um, <laughs> and I, I can see that, and I can see that for some writers like Geoffrey Hill or another of my heroes, Gillian Rose, the philosopher, you just have to take the time with it. Okay, but that's one sort of public, one sort of audience. Otherwise, I think you have to ask, and it's the question I'm always asking if I'm speaking to broadly a non-academic audience, what, almost what are the rhythms you want people to take away? I suppose that's why preachers do things in threes, isn't it? You, you want people to have a song in their minds when they've listened. And that may sound a bit sentimental, but of course songs vary a lot. And a song may be troubling and even discordant at times, but it's still something you want to, to go in. And that, that's why I sometimes feel we don't think enough as theologians, the broadest sense of how we, we communicate like that, communicate a rhythm, a beat of thinking and imagining with the words and the, the images that allow us to, to hold different things together. When I, when I preach, I suppose what I hope people will take away um, is some sense of connectedness again, some sense of a, a beat, a rhythm, if that makes any sense. Dr. Robinson, do you have a...? Uh, well, one thing, I mean, to the extent that I, we don't write theology, one, one thing that I value very much is that I usually have um, an opportunity to write for an audience. And so I, when I, I'm thinking how, how well can this be heard while I'm writing, which I think is... Uh, a good principle for all writing, you know. But theology, I mean, on the one hand, it, it's like, you know, theoretical physics in terms of the fact that it can go into any degree of depth of questions like the nature of time, the nature of being, and all the rest of it. And very valuable things can be said at that level of, it's not even abstraction, but of, of pursuit, you know. Um, but it's also true that it is a, a, an incredibly rich uh, system of, of articulation that, that we receive, um, you know, from, from so many poets and so many theologians and, and, and then the scriptures themselves, you know, this great mind. When you think that every Sunday in the Western world, there are X number of sermons preached, and they're all different, 
you know, some new pair, I mean, not a new pair of eyes, but some pair of eyes has come to a text as if new. Mm -hmm. You know, the richness that lies behind all of that is, is, uh, is something always to be remembered. I'm afraid that too much theology is uh, tinkering, is fine tuning. Uh, it doesn't make use of the fact that there are these huge structures of meaning that are there to be, to help, simply. I, yes, I, I think one, one of the, the issues that I come back to repeatedly teaching theology, and it's something that my wife, who's also a theological teacher, often says, is the lack of the big picture in people's sense of how theology works. That, that feeling that you're actually being introduced into a landscape that really does belong together, make sense together, that you'll only see a bit of it one go, but you have to see it as, as a landscape, not as a set of pieces on a board or, or whatever. And to be aware that you are entering a, a territory of image and word and sound and bit by bit exploring and connecting again, I think that, that's often lacking in how we communicate. It can be very this, absent. This sounds like a good time to talk about language. Both of you are so interested in language um, and this special indication of our humanness <clears throat> that language is and the special capacity. Um, the edge of words, you make that argument very well. Um, what do you think are the chief causes of the degradation in our public discourse and how does that degradation impact us? What do you think we can do about it? Save the world time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. I thought it would never come, the save the world time. I'm glad you're here, Ron. <laughs> well, Well, um, I don't understand that really. I mean, I find that people are actually moved by good language. I think that one of the things that is uh, an affliction, and has been a kind of increasingly an affliction, is that we condescend to one another. This has bothered me forever. Uh, uh, when Abraham Lincoln, a virtually totally uneducated man, wanted to speak to people, he did it with a degree of refinement that is extraordinary by any standard, because he had that kind of respect for the people he was speaking to. These people, I'm afraid, they speak in, in this kind of minimized language that you would use to sell a, a defective product, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, so often, frankly, I have the feeling that if I stopped 35 people on the street and sent them to Washington, D.C., they would do a better job than the contemporary, than the government we have now, you know? <laughs> To whom are we condescending? You know, how have we let ourselves have such negative uh, assumptions about people in general? Democracy cannot survive if we continue to condescend at that level where we don't give good information, we don't articulate things with the sensitivity that they require to be articulated if they're going to be meaningful at all. Everybody ought to stop doing that. That's save the world right there. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll sign up to that. I think. It, it seems we've got some very, um, very diverse, rather contradictory problems and tendencies at the moment. On the one hand, there's what you might call the, the advertising default setting. I've got to sell this to you, so what I need to do is to manipulate your reactions. I need to know which buttons to press. I've got to have the deliverances of the focus group in my mind so that I know, click, 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 you will, you will vote for me, you'll go along with me. That's the functional picture of language. On the other side, strangely, but of course not so strangely when you think that there's every reason to be suspicious, you have a very suspicious approach to language. Okay, so what are they really trying to say? What are they really putting over on me? And you have a mixture of manipulation on one side and cynicism on the other. Now that is the perfect storm, I think, as far as healthy language is concerned. And it is 
definitely lethal for democracy in the long run. That's, it's what creates both a passive and a resentful population. And that's not a democracy, as I understand it. Democracy, I think, is the kind of environment in which genuine argument can continue, in which voices are not only heard but tested and probed and sharpened, where real exchange happens and real movement happens. If all you have is a set of wants, a sort of agenda that somebody is expected to satisfy, what Philip Bobbitt calls the market state, all you ever need from your rulers is you know, advertising skills which, as I say, press the right buttons. And that can't, that can't be right. But that's, you know, that's the danger. And that's where both the, the literary and artistic world and the religious world ought to be really up in arms and battling with all their energy against a real corruption, I'd say. One of the things about democracy as an issue is that historically, we, we've had moments when I think we made good democratic uh, uh, actions, created you know, positive things that we live on still, even though in some cases we seem to have forgotten what they were for. But the, um, the issue a, a democratic citizen has is the question, what kind of world do I want to make for the people around me? What kind of reality do I want the people who I call my community to live in? You know, how can I create institutions or su support traditions or whatever that actually f that free and enlarge the people around me? You know, it's the solidarity thing again. If, if you have contempt for people in general, you have no articulated aspiration for their well-being, their no, no great interest in protecting dignity that you really don't assign them in the first place, you know. Um, and I think that this is one of, the, one of the very negative things that we're allowing to happen. It's, it's to do with what I believe is a misunderstanding of Brecht's famous remark, unhappy the land that needs heroes. Um, the trouble is people have taken that in, in a very cynical way and said, well, so we, we don't need role models. We don't need good narratives any longer. We don't need that story of what a life well lived might look like. And I don't think Brecht meant that. I think he, he meant that there are forms of corrupt and dysfunctional society where you, you have to push images at people. But what we've lost is, is that sense of the life well lived. And I'm fascinated by the way in which in the UK, at least perhaps, well, I think, yes, here too, um, there's a kind of swing of the pendulum back to looking at issues of character, formation, virtue. Um, David Brooks' book about character, which is an interesting case in point, or in Britain, a um, book by Robert Skidelsky about um, economics and society in which he says we've lost that capacity to say what kind of life we want actively to encourage. Here's a, uh, I guess a similar save the world uh, question that uh, is inspired by, it came to my mind when you talked about the, the importance of fiction. Um, to engage fiction, to engage novels requires time and attention and patience. And we're in a very distracted society. Um, how, how do we help people to have the, the value uh, and place the value on taking the time to engage works of fiction where they can have the experiences you were describing? Overall, we need a range of disciplines of time taking. We need to encourage one another, encourage a rising generation probably to do more gardening and more cooking. And maybe save the world by gardening and cooking. Um, <laughs> in, in, the sense, in the sense that there are some things which are good only if you take time with them. And because we tend to assume, well, the quicker the better, 
we don't understand that the good of this activity is the time taken. So that's all about reconnecting with our own bodiliness in some ways. And unfortunately, we, we have the very ambiguous gift these days of social media and electronic communication, which privilege rapid interaction. And as we all know, there ought to be on every computer uh, a leave it overnight button, which we <laughs> press rather, rather than the send button. Um, because we, we have this assumption that the quicker the better. And I was delighted that my daughter this year told me she was giving up social media for Lent. <laughs> I think also it's very important. You know, if, if you read the science that pertains to these things, you find out that you are infinitely complex. <laughs> the complexity of any human being is so great as to guarantee that that is a unique human being, you know, mind and every other aspect of, of your physical existence or your well, physical is kind of probably an archaic word. But in any case, uh, you know, God made one of you, and it's up to you to find out what that creation is. What did he make? Who are you? What are you capable of? I, one of the things that I, I sort of like considering is that God knows our dreams. You know, we're asleep. We probably don't remember them, but God knows them, right? <laughs> um, in that there's a, uh, there's a beauty in the stream of human thought that, that you collaborate in and your culture collaborates in and many other things. But it's a singular beauty that you, if you wrote the best poetry in the world, could not sufficiently to c communicate to anyone else. It's just between you and God, you know? That's a, a splendid privilege if you think about it in the context of the universe, it is a literally mind-boggling privilege, you know? So I think that a great deal of what people need to do is enjoy themselves, enjoy being themselves, enjoy finding out what capacities they have, what they, what they love to look at, you know? What they love to taste, the whole thing of being uniquely yourself and brilliantly equipped to be yourself. I, you know, not in a narrow individualist sense, but in the sense that God knows, I know. I know, God knows. That's the, the ultimate mystic, mystical experience. It requires nothing except that you be respectfully attentive to yourself in that sense. So Do you that's, think that fiction and the art of the novel uh, teaches us that? Because I think it does. I think it should. <laughs> the better novels more, the lesser novels less. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's, that's right about novels. That I, I come away from a good novel, whatever it's been about, thinking actually there's, there's more of me and there's more of others than I ever noticed. And that sense that there's, there's more to the person, me or you, the world, the, the opening up into some sort of depth that I can't own or get my head around. The novel, the play does, does just that. It's looking down a long, 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 long vista. Providing inherent value to the characters, you can't... Uh you know, say I'm going to write a novel about a character without giving that character value mm -hmm. and valuing their experience. I so. think that's why um, some people have said a bad novel is where a novelist quite clearly doesn't love his or her characters. And that doesn't mean that a novelist um, gets sentimental about characters or approves what they do or whatever, but the novelist who doesn't love, who doesn't actually seek to realize that dimensionality is, is failing. I agree with that completely, and it provides a wonderful link to my next question. Um, I'm a Flannery O'Connor scholar, and I've heard you publicly say that Flannery O'Connor doesn't love her, her characters. <laughs> so I'm hoping to get you engaged with each other about, about Flannery O'Connor. 
This is where we fight, is it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, it's, I, you know, I have a special history with Flannery O'Connor. I mean, she's, she's a mythic figure in Iowa City because she was one of our students. And you can't walk past the church she went to every day, all these other things, without being reminded her, of her as a, a little southern girl that was forever cold you know, <laughs> who had to write her name so that people could understand it because her accent was so deep. Um, she uh, bothers me. I mean, I, <laughs> one reason is because I have taught so many students who are trying to write in the style of Flannery O'Connor. And, well, I mean, she, she was a very good stylist, and they're not reliably, you know, but <laughs> but the thing that is characteristic that they feel that they're taking from her is grotesquerie of a cruel kind, mm -hmm. condescension, you know. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I'm very sorry for her. She had a hard life. It's sad that she saw her father die of the same disease that she would then feel in her own body. Um, but nevertheless, I don't feel as if she credits her characters with, oddly enough, enough intelligence to be credited also with a soul. Because a soul is intelligent, whatever the mind is, you know? Um, and that bothers me. And, and I feel that she doesn't identify with them, really except in, in, in displacing the cruelty of her circumstance onto their circumstance. I'm sure I will, in some cosmic moment of justice, I will eat my words. <laughs> well, let me put in a, a word for Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> um, but it's very interesting what you said there about intelligence. It seems to me that in a, at least her best stories, Intelligence, in the sense you mean, is, or I think, I think you mean, is what they are obliged to discover against their own, all their own probabilities or all, all their own temptations. And it's a kind of breakthrough to, to understanding, which is often helplessly ironic and shadowed in all, all sorts of ways. And yet there is that, that dawning of something of self-recognition, of whatever. The cruelty thing is, is again, an interesting point. I, I'm thinking there of a parallel case in the visual arts, a visual artist whose work I know fairly well in the UK. That's Lucian Freud, the late Lucian Freud. And um, a lot of his paintings strike people as, as cruel. They're in the sense that they are merciless. That is, the, the visual representation is, is unsparing. It's, it's, you know, greasy, shiny, overweight flesh. It's lazy, sagging faces. It's, it's a landscape of rather unremitting bleakness sometimes. Brilliant from the technical point of view, but not exactly life-enhancing as, as you look at it. I guess that over the years, looking, looking at him again and again, and we've got a picture of his on the wall of our sitting room, I, I do sense increasingly that that's not the whole story, that there is a relatedness, an empathy, a, a connection, again, coming through. And the cruelty is just one stage. It's almost as if he's trying, as perhaps Flannery O'Connor's trying, to overcompensate for an instinctive rapport or identification. I don't know. But. Um, there's a way in which his paintings are, seem to me to be a sort of meditation on the flesh. Very much, yes. There's almost no, I mean, if you look at him, <laughs> it's very hard not to recognize that in one's vulnerable moments, 
you know, one is a pathetic fleshy object, you know. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas uh, I don't feel that there's not an implied universalism in Flannery O'Connor's characters. The sort of bewilderment that they inhabit is their bewilderment, and I think that we look at them very much from the outside in that sense. I'd still give her the benefit of the doubt, I think, on, on, the, <laughs> on the score that we are allowed to, we're allowed to follow changes that happen within them, which seems to me to say more than just that they're seen from outside. Well, we're not going to agree about this, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I want to insist on this. <laughs> uh, maybe this will bring you together. Um, <laughs> One of the things, well, yes, yes. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, impressed itself upon me in, in my reading of Gilead is that um, it presents you with life in its ordinariness. And um, worldwide, we are in a celebrity-obsessed culture, and we give significance to uh, being someone if you can get that kind of attention. And there's almost a disdain for the ordinary. So I was wondering if you could both just help us to think about how to give more attention to ordinariness uh, and more value to ordinary life. It's a version of your earlier question about time, isn't it? That sometimes we... Hmm, we want the, the immediate sense of glamour, gratification, or drama. We can't understand that the prosaic, the everyday always accumulates towards glory, as you might say, because we want the glory now, we want, we want the fix. So something to do with, with the passage of time and the sheer entry into the moment, the, the stillness of the moment so that we're not all the time seeking to be somewhere else. And another bit of Augustine, I guess, um, where in the Confessions he says, in effect, the problem isn't that God's not here, the problem is that I'm not here. You know, I'm, I'm everywhere but here, in this moment, in this particular prosaic, ordinary, physical, or whatever environment. And it seems to me that Part of the function of really effective art is, in that sense, to slow us down and bring us to, to that particularity, doing good in small particulars, as, as Blake says. And one of the things I like about Seamus Heaney's poetry, thinking of another contemporary artist, is Heaney's got this great gift for making you see you know, the prosaic things stacked up in a Northern Irish farmhouse and seeing the, the radiance of these ordinary things, that, that famous, famous image of the, um, the scoop, the metal scoop immersed in the grain tub and you can see it gleaming in, in the middle of the grain. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture. I think again, I mean, when I think about the ordinary, and that's a word apparently that I use a lot, huh? um, <laughs> I think about that sense of the strange miracle of oneselfness, you know? Um, when I've been away from home for a while, uh, you know, I come, come downstairs in the morning and I put together what I consider to be the perfect breakfast, which has a lot to do with toast and butter, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, there are, I think, really, I mean, combining the, the sense of the ordinary or the, you know, habitual with the sacramental, that's very strong in my mind. There are certain things, there are moments that you choose that can be very simple and have, you know, simply be what your mother did or what your grandmother did or something. But, but it puts you in this sort of, you know, the rope of sand. It puts you in the continuous, continuously sort of fragmented reality that you restore by remembering this plain thing, this simple thing, you know. Um, I, 
it's the, I think that we talk ourselves into things like that we're interested in a celebrity, you know? And then you turn your back for a minute and come, and the celebrities are sort of forgotten, become a little bit of a joke maybe. And you're on to the next celebrity, you know? And this is very, it's a distraction. I don't, th I mean, I think that very few people over the age of 14 identify in a serious way with a celebrity. Um, but they are distractions. They are the shiny objects, you know? I think we get told things like we're interested in celebrities. And this makes us pay more attention to the magazines and the checkout of the grocery store. But uh, in terms of how people actually live and what they feel, I think it is, uh, how do I get along with my children? You know, what do I do with a problem that looks like a looming problem? And, you know, that will require all this, the understanding that I can muster. I think people live at that level, really, and maybe take a certain amount of relief from the fact that there is always a new magazine cover. It's connected to my mind with the fact that people are often more generous and more free than the media give them credit for being. Absolutely. And it doesn't do to forget that, does it? Because you read a lot of media or watch media, and the picture you have of the default setting for human beings is a pretty hectic, mean-spirited, anxious, frantic, selfish one. Yes. And actually, that's not how most people live most of their lives, thank God. Yes, thank God <laughs> indeed. <laughs> but two, two things came to mind um, reflecting further on this. Um, hmm. Perhaps just, just one for, for now. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about another British poet whose centenary we celebrated last year. It was a man called Charles Causley. Um, he was a poet who lived in Cornwall, and for most of his life, he was a teacher in the local elementary school. He'd grown up in this little village in Cornwall. He'd left to do his war service. He'd come back, and he'd been a teacher. And that's all he'd ever done, and he wrote poems. <laughs> and the poems have a very, um, direct, very physical, very vernacular feel. This is the language of the people. They're written in very simple rhythms, but very, very sophisticated content. But the last poem in his final collected poems, not the last one he wrote, but he, he chose to put it at the end of his collected poems, is a piece called Eden Rock. And it's actually about death and resurrection, about heaven, I think. And he says, he can see them across, across the river, see his parents. Um, they're in their 20s. He can just about remember them when he was a little boy, looking like that. His father in his, in his Sunday suit with, with the family dog as a puppy, and the mother in a summer dress and um, a bottle of milk with a screw of paper tucked in the top and the sandwiches and the, the plates for a picnic. And they, they call to me, he says, can you see the path across the stream? It's, it's not difficult. And then there's a gap, and Cosley ends the poem, I had not thought that it would be like this. And the absolute simplicity of that last line, all monosyllables, and it's, it is to me, it's about heaven. I had not thought that it would be like this. It's that simple transition. The order the prosaic things of this world suddenly, as he says, the three plates laid out for the picnic, like three suns shining. And that absolutely prosaic, absolutely transcendent moment that says something about the ordinary, doesn't it? That's, I think, a really great expression about why I love John Ames so much. He lives in that place. And here he's writing sermon after sermon after sermon. Um, I think probably some pastors out there might say it's kind of a thankless job to be preaching to a small church, a small congregation. And his faithfulness over time 
we watch him kind of in the process of being sanctified by that through the course of the novel. And I think that's so beautiful so that he's able to make the tough decision to accept Jack, to change, to grow. And uh, I just love that because I, I think about the process of, of habits that you have. And he had the habit of writing sermons and he, um, week after week and that, that transformed him, living in the language, working like that. So I think my question is, uh, do you think that there are any spiritual habits or practices that uh, the church should do a better job of, of teaching us um, to live inside of practices or habits that we have avoided that we would do well to return to? Yes. <laughs> um, rhythm again, isn't it? We've lost the sense of creating rhythm in our, our daily encounter with God. We, we think sometimes that real encounter with God has to be exceptional, exciting, different, dramatic, and we don't think of it as simply turning up and simply turning up in the sense of opening the Bible, reciting a psalm, simply turning up in the quiet we give to God, simply turning up once every few hours just to say, yep, yeah, okay, draw back into, into the heart and remember who's there. We need formation in those things. We need encouragement to, to develop those, those habits, but they're, they're painfully simple. I'll put like that, painfully simple. And because we don't get that sense of the reality shining in things, the ordinary things, we, we miss that, we, we turn away. And so many poets, of course, have written about just that. There's, there's a novel by um, Thomas Kinsella, the uh, Australian, so, sorry, Thomas Kennelly, the Australian novelist, which has the wonderful title, Three Cheers for the Paraclete. <laughs> um, it's about, um, it's about a, a set of deeply dysfunctional Roman Catholic priests in Sydney in the 1960s. Um, it's very funny indeed, <clears throat> but very poignant as well. But at one point, the, the main character, uh, one of the priests, is called to join in the examination of a potentially heretical nun in a convent school. And this hapless nun is hauled in in front of the clergy and quizzed about what she's teaching her students. And apparently she's been using heretical phrases like, you know, God being the ground of our being and that sort of thing. And and how, you know, the mystery of God escapes all our formulations. And the priests scratch their heads and worry deeply about all this. And eventually, when she's dismissed, the, the young priest we've been following hurries out of the room after her and says, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry about all that, he says, but I just want to know one thing. Have you seen God, sister? And she shrugs and says, well, sometimes you just see reality shining in things. <laughs> and that it takes habit, if you'll excuse the pun, <laughs> to, to, to do that. I think that one of the things, I mean, this is just from my own experience. Um, I find that a lot of Protestant churches um, are uh, embarrassed about uh, things that, that are traditional. That there's this, you know, that there's this, a sense that as things become, you know, generationally older, they lose relevance, um, and uh, there have been, all, you know, the the chaos that has been caused in a lot of churches by this anxiety. I think is pretty well known. I think that one of the most important things that churches have to tell people is that you're part of the stream of humankind. That you, if you listen carefully, you can hear something that was said 500 years ago that you will feel as true in the marrow of your bones. You know, we don't have to scrap the, the, the brilliant hymns and the, you know, the brilliant articulations um, 
it's not only the fact that there's a great deal of loss in, entailed in that, but also a, a kind of misrepresentation of what we are, which is what any of us is, which is a member of a generation that will have a history and pass away and be displaced by other generations of whom all the same things are true. Um, it's so, you know, hearing these old hymns that were sung here, uh, it's so moving to me because I can't hear them without thinking how many people have been moved by those songs, you know. Um, and even the quaintnesses of the language that persists in old hymns and so on, that's part of, that's, you know, that's our brother in another century singing to us in the language that was available to him. You know, uh, it's a wonderful intimacy with the idea of human human life beyond the little capsule of human time that we experience. Um, I think that, you know, that's part of what religion is, that's part of what Christianity is, the recognition that we are Adam. We are a part of the great initial, universal, brilliant creation of humankind, not to segregate ourselves from it, e temporally as well as in any other way. We got time for, I think, two more questions. So, uh, real, real quickly, mine would be I uh, don't know whether the answer is quick, of course. Um, um, you've both talked about memory at some point during the conference and looking back. Uh, and Dr. Williams, particularly, you talked about you know, the complications of our memories, of our, of our past, you know, the, the, the glory and the shame. That, that's, uh, I mean, every history, every family, every country has a complicated history, right? There is no pristine history. Um, how do we remember well without being overly selective about the great things and, she, and forgetting the bad things, but also not letting the negative dimensions of history lead us to having a disdain for the history that we have as well? The truth will set you free, somebody said. <laughs> and to accept the truth of the mixed history we all have as communities and individuals is, I think, a key just to, to growing up. It means that I look at my past self and think, how could I have thought that? How could I have done that? But I did, and it's part of me, and it's part of what God sees, and it's part of what God works with. Only if it's brought into the light can it fully be worked with. And the same applies if we look back Rather than just say, oh, how could they have thought that? How could they have done that in a previous age, being contemptuous towards the past? Say, well, like me, these were people with partial perspectives, partial understanding, and they did their best, and they did it pretty badly, like me. And bringing that into the light, acknowledging it about them and with them, I think that's, that's how we... Actually, that's how we live in the communion of saints, I think, as something that extends over time. Because we're, we're great chronological snobs, aren't we? And we love to think how stupid our predecessors were. And without realizing that that, of course, means we will be thought of as equally stupid by our successors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things that I think we need to do more of is look at what we have received that is of really unambiguous value. You know, we've been talking about the abolitionists and the founding of this college and who knows how many others. I mean, the University of Colorado was founded the same way. The, this movement was extraordinarily large <laughs> and forgotten. But nevertheless, uh, I think that any one of us feels fortunate to be here and feels fortunate to know that there are places like this all over the country. And, you know, uh, people intentionally made these places. They made them with intentions that were perhaps higher than ours, have been in, in sustaining them and living with them. Um, and you can, you can look at any individual person who was a part of this, your Jonathan Blanchard or, or any, and uh, of course they did stupid things, and of course they probably wrote ugly letters and things, you know, who knows what they did. But uh, 
we have a tendency to say, well, you know, he seemed like a very idealistic figure, but in fact, you know, and it's as if the but in fact cancels out the he was a very good productive person in this this role in his life, you know. Um, we're, we're brutal. We have to all hope that God is a great deal kinder than we are. And, uh, and, and stop being so eager to find out the most negative thing that you can say about anyone. And, uh, you know, have the good grace to acknowledge the fact that we have been given extraordinary things. Our educational system, of course, is always the, the uh, metaphor that comes to my mind. But so many things, all the churches that have been maintained at great cost, often by small congregations. And I mean, I remember when I came to Iowa City and found that big old congregational church on Main Street. I was so grateful that for 150 years, people had kept it there, you know, through thick and thin. Um, we have, in order to maintain what we have, and I think that increasingly as things become tenuous in certain ways, we realize that we have a great deal that is precious, that we want to maintain. Um, stop looking for ways to undervalue. Be, be conscious, be intentional about valuing what is clearly good. And remembering always that it is good by someone's design as a consequence of any, any amount of collaboration, you know. Um, we, we have a habit of thinking that only cynicism is honest. And, and this is a terrible blindness. One last question. Um, there are a lot of students here, um, which is really great. And if you could go back to your 20-year-old self and give yourself advice that would apply to them, would you be willing to share? You know, I was so, I was such a boring 20-year-old. <laughs> I basically, I stayed in my room at college and read books. I have, I cannot regret this for one moment, frankly. <laughs> Great. I think that's a perfect answer. <laughs> Oh, I think I'd probably say to my my 20-year-old self, be less anxious. Um, be more grateful. Be more grateful. I think probably that's the beginning of all wisdom, being grateful. And I'm not sure that when I was 20, I was thankful enough for the world I was in and the people I was with. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Well, Dr. Williams, Dr. Robinson, thank you so much.